Hey everyone, today let's talk about the witch report and covering some alarming issues about sunscreens in the UK. This video is a bit of a ramble because there are some conflicting statements about this report and essentially I'm not sure you can trust it. So let's get started. Now, Witch is a very popular consumer agency in the UK. It's an organization that advocates for consumers. They carried out spot checks on 26 different sunscreens that are available in the UK. And the results have been quite controversial. From the article that they published recently, three out of the 26 popular sunscreens had failed their testing. Now, there are a few questions I have to this. Number one, how did they test these SPFs? How does that compare to the global standards of SPF testing? which sunscreens failed and why did they fail. Now let's just start with talking about the testing, which say they use the ISO 24444. This is the International Standards Organization and this is their gold standard for SPF testing. The ISO look to maintain the standards of loads of goods and services across the world. Now which say they use this standard of testing involving human volunteers. Now this involves applying SPF to a certain area, exposing them to UV light and seeing how long it takes for redness to appear compared to the bare skin. This is considered the gold standard for SPF testing. And this is what they use to calculate the SPF racing for a product. The testing is specific for UVB rays, which cause burning of the skin. Now, which say they used a minimum of 10 volunteers for each SPF. They really didn't disclose much else about their SPF testing. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, which also say they tested the SPFs from a different method called the ISO 2 four, 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 three. Now this is more specific for UVA radiation and it's tested in vitro. This means it's not used on real human skin. They instead apply the sunscreen to glass plates and they see how much UVB radiation is filtered by the SPF. Now, which say that they did this at an independent lab. The ISO standards are so specific, they tell you exactly how they want you to apply the SPF to ensure fair testing of each product. They have a very specific amount of SPF they want you to use measured in drops, and they even tell you how to apply it. For example, they say you need to start with circular motions and then swipe up and down and then left to right. Now, these are the three SPFs that the witch testing failed. Firstly, we have this Asda Protect SPF 30. This is something that was available for £2.80. The next one is this Calypso SPF 30 Press and Protect. And the last one, which is probably the most controversial because I know so many people have been recommended this. This is the Bondi Sands SPF 50. Now, the companies have made a couple of statements against this report, and as the spokesperson said that they actually had the SPF retested after seeing this, and they said that their testing actually said the SPF was 31, which is higher than what they've written on the bottle. So they've said that they don't actually recognize the which results. Calypso said something similar. They said that all their SPFs have passed all the EU regulation standards, which follows this ISO testing. And Bondi Sand said something really similar. They said their SPF 50 actually had an SPF rating of 61. So they again don't agree with the witch testing. They said that all of their products go through rigorous testing methods and they said they're willing to work with witch to see what went wrong. So what does this all mean? Now I have so many caveats to all of this research and all this information that I think it's really important for us to know. Now which as a consumer group are supposed to be this independent group that helps consumers to know what to buy, what to trust, what not to trust. They're supposed to be unbiased. And I think that is really important because lots of brands do need to be held accountable for whatever claims they make on the bottles. And it's companies like this that hold them accountable. And this is similar to the reason why I started making videos on YouTube because I felt like as a consumer, it's so hard to navigate this whole world and know exactly what you can and can't buy, what you can and can't trust. So a company like which is great for stuff like this. But there are a few things that have made me question this whole thing. Before we carry on, I just wanna say, if you're liking this video, hit the subscribe button below. I release videos every week about skincare and dermatology. Now, two years before, which also did a similar type of testing in 2022. They tested a whole range in the similar types of methods and they actually failed different sunscreens. Now, what's interesting is that in that round of research, they actually passed the Calypso and Asda SPFs. So unless which can tell us what went wrong or what went differently with their testing cycles that were two years apart, we have no idea which one we can trust. This mismatch makes it not very convincing. Now, I'm really quite disappointed that which haven't released more information about the testing they've done 
All they said is that they followed those ISO guidelines and they used a minimum of 10 people per SPF. Again, this doesn't tell us about the types of people that they tested the SPF on, different demographics, different skin types. This can all influence how you rate an SPF. We literally have no information about the race, the age, the gender of the people used to test it. One thing to bear in mind is that you can get variation between batches of SPFs and year on year products will get updated depending on the availability of ingredients, things that happen in the factory, the processes that might become more streamlined and that might slightly change the product that we see each year. In theory, these formulation updates should still get the same SPF rating, but that might be the difference that happened between testing the Asda and Calypso in 2022 and testing it now. This might also explain the discrepancies between the products being tested from the makers and the brands versus what Witch saw. The other thing that Witch haven't told us is the actual SPF ratings that they were getting from these products that caused them to fail. From the SPFs that claimed they were 30, were we getting SPF of 20 or less, or was it something like 25? I think that does make a difference from our expectations of a product. I do think that the main issue we have globally with SPFs is that we don't apply it properly. And in that context, we actually reduce the SPF rating that we get from a product. If I don't apply the SPF properly, it really doesn't even matter if it's an SPF 50 because I will only get SPF 40 out of it because I'm just not applying it properly. So I do think as a consumer, you kind of have to take that as a pinch of salt because unless you are committing to applying it properly, you aren't gonna be getting that highest rating that's on the bottle. That's why I always recommend everyone to use an SPF 50 so that you are getting a slightly higher rating even if you don't apply it properly. I do think that means that there's no point being pernickety about the smallest number of SPF ratings because we have to take some personal responsibility in applying it properly anyway. Just remember the rating on the bottle is something you get only when you apply a really generous amount of the SPF. So what can we do about all this information? First of all, make sure you apply a proper amount of SPF. I've said this loads and loads of times before, it doesn't really matter where you live, it just means that you will get proper protection. You need to apply two finger lengths worth of SPF. And I know that's much harder when you have sprays or stick SPFs, but you need to be applying a generous amount and reapplying throughout the day. Like I mentioned earlier, you can use an SPF with a higher rating so that you make sure you're getting the maximum benefit you can get. Lots of people rely on SPF 15s or 30s. I really don't see the point. Next, I'd say don't rely on SPFs in other products. Some people will say that there's SPF in my foundation so I don't need to apply SPF every day. It really doesn't work that way. You will never apply the correct amount of SPF. Even with your foundation, you're not getting that full coverage. Foundation comes off throughout the day as well. You don't have a proper amount of SPF as you would if you used a dedicated product for it. Next, I'd say that there are other ways to protect you from the sun. SPF is really, really important, but you can protect yourself by wearing generous sized hats, covering up your arms and legs with light or comfy clothing, things like linen shirts. Those can really protect you from the sun as well as the SPF as well. So don't just rely on one method, particularly if you live in a really sunny country like Australia or you're out all day, you can use multiple methods to protect you. And lastly, sun protection isn't about the most popular or the most expensive product. It's all about finding a product you like that you'll actually use. So my overall feelings about this generally controversial report is that SPF testing and SPF formulating is actually really, really tricky. And it's really hard for brands to get this perfectly right. A lot of time and research does go into testing those SPFs. I think that there is gonna be variation from batch to batch, but I think you can prioritize how you apply an SPF first, and that will help overcome those slight variations. Let me know what you think about this controversial witch report. I wanna hear about it in the comments. Do you think we should trust it? If you're hanging around, I'll link a video where I went through all of the empty SPFs that I went through whilst living in Australia for two years. Is. There are some Korean brands, some Australian brands, and some UK brands in it. Thanks for watching.